Hello. Uh, the purpose of uh, this uh, video is uh, to introduce you to the concept of um, of limits of functions. So limits of functions. All right. So. Uh, to to begin, and I, I like to to mention that limit of functions is the central uh, notion of real analysis, and um, the concept of limits is uh, in fact central to the concept of continuity and to the concept of derivative. And continuity is something that we are heading to, and derivative is a concept that some of you will be uh, will be taking uh, 402 will be exposed to. So this is an important concept, and everything that we've done so far really is to prepare us for this lecture. So, so what is the plan? The plan is uh, to talk about the concept of cluster point and isolated point. And uh, we'll talk about equivalent definitions of um, of the limit of a function. We'll talk about the sequential criteria. sequential criterion and uh, uh, also we'll talk about divergence criterion criteria all right so that's the plan of the lesson so let's let's get let's get going um, so first cluster point and isolated points as a definition uh, let's let a be a non-empty subset of the real numbers suppose a is non-empty for now um, a point C is called a cluster point of A if every na uh, delta neighborhood every delta neighborhood of C contains at least one point of A distinct from C. So, to illustrate this idea, let's let me consider the real line. And uh, suppose I have I have some set A. Suppose this is my set A. And um, let's pick C, for example, somewhere, just randomly. So I'll pick C somewhere. And uh, I want C to be a cluster point of, um, of, this, uh, of this set. So let's start by selecting a delta neighborhood of C.
suppose this is a delta neighborhood of C, so that will be uh, an open set, right? Where uh, this point here will be C minus delta, and this point here will be C plus delta, and, uh, and this here is uh, the set V delta C. Okay, so we take a delta neighborhood of uh, of this of this uh, of this point C, and uh, you can see that it intersects. I can find an element, say D, which is inside, which is at the intersection of um, uh, V delta C and A. Right, so there exists D in A and D is not C and also D is uh, at the intersection of V delta C and, and A okay so because these conditions are satisfied then we say that C is a cluster point Okay, so that this is a nice illustration for of uh, of the concept of cluster points. So a cluster point is a point. Um, we say that C is a cluster point for a set if every delta neighborhood of C contains at least one point of A, which is distinct from from C. Now. There, of course, a few things to to be aware of. So I have some remark here. So note if C is um, a cluster point for A, which is a subset of the reals, then C actually does not does not have to be an element of A. Secondly, if um, C is a cluster point of A, then um, given delta, which is positive, then we know that um, there exists uh, D which is in A, D is not C, and D is an element of V delta C intersect A. So in this case, the intersection uh, V delta C, uh, uh, the, the, the set V delta C intersect A is, uh, is never empty. All right. Uh, it, it's, it, it makes sense at this point to look at some examples, some specific examples. So first, let A be the set containing 1, 2, and then 3. Then, right, so we have this set here, 1, 2, and then three. Okay, so this is a discrete set containing three elements. And um, let's consider three, for example. If I consider three, and I look at uh, a, a neighborhood of radius half center at three, so so this neighborhood here. So this will be um, v half of three, v half I mean of three. So this will be three point five here. And this will be two point five. Right. So this is the open set two point five, three point five. Then uh, 
you can see that um, <clears throat> this neighborhood V half 3 intersect A is empty, right? In other words, 1 is not in the open interval 2.5, 3.5, and you can see that 2, um, I'm sorry, it's, this is not, um, this is not what I mean here. It's, I don't mean that it's empty. Let me, let me be a little bit more precise. What I mean is the following. First, um, 1 is, um, is not in V half. 3 and 2 is uh, not in a half neighborhood of 3 so the only point of A in uh, V half 3 is uh, is 3 right so so this violates the definition of a cluster point so therefore therefore uh, 3 is not a cluster point of of the set a okay all right, let's look at another example. Take this set here. Let A be the set which contains 0, 1, union, let's say 2. So this is zero here, this is one. And let's say this is two somewhere here, right? So if you take, if we let, so notice that, notice that uh, V, let's say half of two, only intersect Uh, a at 2 thus 2 is not a cluster point of A however let's say for any delta which is positive, or let me say let, I'll say let delta be a positive number, then um, a delta neighborhood of 1 um, for um, Let's see, then for any, then there exists, then there exists, let's say, little a in big A, such that little a is not 1, and um, a is inside, um, V delta of one. Therefore, one is a cluster point of of A. 
okay uh you can you should you should try here to pause the video and check for yourself that zero is also a cluster point uh for this for this set moving forward we'll need another definition precisely uh given a set a subset of real numbers point which are not uh, cluster points so sometimes I use the word accumulation point and they really mean the same thing okay so cluster points are also accumulation points so points which are not cluster points of uh, a are called isolated isolated points okay, I should use I should use a uh, color here I call isolated points of a so this we shall see that C is uh, an isolated we shall see that C is an isolated point of A if there is a delta neighborhood of C which does not contain all the points of A besides C okay all right, so so for example, um, in the set, if we let A be the set containing one, two, and three, uh, <coughs> then every point in A is an isolated point. okay very good now let's continue with um, a theorem the following theorem says the following a number c which is a real number is a is a cluster points of a so a number c is a cluster point of A of a set A if and only if there exist a sequence if and only if there exist a sequence a n in A uh, such that such that uh, the limit of A n as n is approaching infinity is equal to C and uh, A n uh, is not C for every natural number n. Okay. Okay, so let's try to substantiate uh, this theorem with a proof. Um, 
so of course this is a biconditional statement so there are really two things to prove so let's start with uh, the first part so if uh, C is a cluster point then then given some natural number n let's say the 1 over n neighborhood around C right contains at least uh, one point from A which is not C okay right so this is the definition of a cluster point and because C is a cluster point if you give me any n then I can find uh, inside the 1 over n neighborhood of C some point of A which is not which is not C then clearly um, a n is in A and A n is not C and also by definition the distance the distance between uh, a n and uh, C which is precisely the absolute value of a n minus C by definition is less than 1 over n so if we let epsilon be greater than 0 then uh, by the Archimedean property we know that uh, uh, there exists there is um, a natural number n call it big n of course depending on epsilon such that um, such that n is bigger than 1 over epsilon okay all right now so for for little n bigger than big n uh, then we'll have that little n is bigger than of course 1 over epsilon by transitivity and consequently the distance between a n and c which is less than 1 over n will be less than epsilon therefore uh, the limit of a n as n is approaching infinity will be equal to c okay so if you have a cluster point then then you can find you can find a sequence uh, which is again uh, inside the set such that every term of the sequence is not c and that sequence is also getting closer and closer to um, to c now for the converse uh, we will um, so for the converse assume uh, that there is a sequence let's say a n in uh, in the sets a take away little c such that the limit of a n as n is approaching infinity is equal to c now I will let delta be a positive number then uh, there is um, um, there is n 
of course, um, which is a natural number uh, depending on epsilon, depending on delta, I mean, sorry, depending on delta, such that if uh, little n is bigger than capital N, then uh, the distance between a n and c can be made less than than delta. Okay, uh, so this is the definition of uh, uh, by the epsilon n criteria, right? So by the epsilon n criteria, this can be achieved. So thus, um, a n is an element of the set a take away c and a n is uh, in the set v delta in the uh, de in a de delta neighborhood of c thus c is a cluster point of a All right. So 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 we have indeed proved uh, our our theorem and let's move forward. I will uh, I will continue with uh, a few remarks. The first one, the first remark that I would like to make is the following. Isolated isolated points will play a limited role in uh, in the concept of um, of limit. Uh, so, for example, uh, <clears throat> we are not. So, so for the the, the reason why you know um, we the, we won't care is if you take a set of the type one, two, three, right? Um, you know, by definition, we'll tie the concept of cluster point to the concept of existence of uh, of uh, sequences which are sort of converging to um, to your cluster points, and we know that in this. Uh, uh, we can see that if a is this, then a only has um, only has isolated points, and the con this, the concept of uh, sequences here is maybe not that uh, interesting. Uh, so let's look at another example. Let a be one two. Then um, I claim that uh, every point here, every point of the set K containing one to two is a cluster point. Since for every X which is in K, if I pick any x which is in k and for uh, every delta which is a positive, I can find the sets x that exist. So let me try this. That exist. There is y let's say in um, in a such that y belongs to the the delta neighborhood of x uh, <coughs> which makes sense right because you'll have uh, if uh, this is our set so we'll have one uh, I mean one to two, we have one here, and uh, 
even if I, I were to pick one and pick let's say any delta neighborhood around one no matter how small this delta neighborhood is then uh, you take you have this set here right which is uh, let's say some some v delta one and, and of course you can always find some some element y which is at the intersection of uh, which is inside a right and is also an element of v delta one and of course here uh, uh, it is important to say that y is not x and uh, uh, is not so for us here y is not going to be uh, why is not going to be one? Okay, all right. And you can play the same game for every element in uh, in this compact set here. Therefore, uh, the set of all cluster points uh, is uh, is in fact for for A is the closed interval one to two. All right, so you can see here. Let's see. Suppose you decide to pick an element here. Then, then clearly, if you take an open interval around this element, which is uh, with some neighborhood delta, then you can see again that um, if this is x. Then this will be uh, v some delta x, and then again you can find inside here you can find some y prime right where y prime is not x and y prime is uh, is inside the the neighborhood. All right. Let's look at uh, another example. Let's consider the set. Let A be negative one, one, union two, three, union one, five, um, I'm sorry, union four, five, union ten, fourteen, for example. Okay. So if, uh, if this is the real line, suppose this is our real line, um, so negative one is here, one is there, we have two here, three, four, five, and 10 to 14 somewhere here so 10 to 14 with everything so our sets is a union of a discrete set with a connected uh, closed interval okay so um i i, I claim that first I, first i claim that the, the sets um the set of cluster points. Uh, I'm sorry. Here, I would like to use uh, something a little different here. Uh, let me let me make some um, some changes. I would like this to be open. Two, two, three. So we'll open it here from two. Two, three. So we have everything here. But it's sort of open uh, there and open there. Okay. Okay, so uh, our set looks more like this. Uh, so I claim that the set of uh, cluster points. Do you want to guess what the set of cluster points here is? Is two, three, union, ten, fourteen, and uh, the set of uh, isolated points. is uh, negative 1, 1, 4, 5. Okay.
Very good. Now, let's consider, for example, the set of all natural numbers. The set of um, natural numbers. Consists of counting numbers 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and so on. And uh, so this set has no cluster points. This set has no cluster points. Now let's let A be the sets 1 to n, where n is a natural number. Uh, so, so we have uh, essentially the sets is uh, containing these numbers here. Let me. Um, so you have uh, one, one half. one third and so on and these numbers are getting closer and closer to zero but they will never actually reach zero right so you have one third one over four and, and so on right so uh, I claim that uh, zero I claim that zero is uh, the only Zero is the only cluster point for A. Since if you give me any delta which is greater than zero, um, there exists there exists uh, some natural number M. Such that Uh, 1 over M is an element of um, a delta neighborhood around 0 right so so if you if you pick so let's say let's say this is um, this is some delta neighborhood around 0 So, so you have negative delta here, you have delta. And if this is V delta zero, then then you can find you can find one over M such that uh, one over M is an element of this set. This uh, every point. in A is an uh, isolated point. All right, so let's uh, look at uh, another example. <coughs> um, I, uh, I claim that the set of all cluster points of uh, the set of rational numbers uh, Q is uh, is the set uh, of all real numbers So indeed, let x be an arbitrary real numbers. Be an arbitrary real number. Then uh, 
given any delta which is positive there is there exists a rational number R such that uh, V delta X um, intersects let's say uh, there exists a rational number R which is inside such that R is uh, inside uh, v delta x which is uh, essentially x minus delta x plus delta and of course and of course x uh, is not is not r right so uh, <coughs> so in other words so, so the point here is really is uh, to appeal to the density of the rationals, right? In the, uh, so this this is due. This is uh, due to uh, the density of um, of the rationals. So the point being is that um, given. Uh, given delta which is positive uh, the open interval x minus delta x plus delta contains a rational number contains some rational number r and if it turns out that uh, x is itself a rational number then um, we can pick this rational number to be, of course, distinct from um, from x. Okay. All right. So, so if you if you give me any any uh, uh, rational any real number, I can find a sequence of rational number which is convergent to that real number. Given any um, real number, real number x there is a sequence of um, rational numbers converging converging uh, to x and this is actually leading us to um, another definition of um, of the of the um, of the real numbers, and this definition is stated as follows: We can, in fact, now define the um, the real the real numbers as as follows: the set of all real numbers is. Uh, The set of uh, cluster points for the rationals. Okay. All right. So, so, so the point being that again uh, to um, illustrate this idea the two possibility right so if you give me any real number let's say r it's possible that r is a rational number it's also possible that r is not a rational number but in any case if you if you give me any open sets around this this rational number R minus delta and R plus delta, I can find, I can find uh, some some rational number, let's say little q, 
inside inside um, V delta R and, and Q is not R and this is the density of the rationals and, and similarly even if R is not a rational number so it's not an element of the rational in this in this case then you can still you can still find for any for any delta neighborhood you can still find another rational number in here so get it this q in uh, q is a rational there is this q in this set where q is rational and of course q is a uh, it's not R. Ah. Alright, so another definition, if you remember at the beginning of the semester I told you that uh, to be able to define what a real number is, we sort of needed a lot of uh, preliminary uh, concepts. And uh, in the, the study of sequences leads naturally to a very simple definition of the set of our real numbers and we have done all the work this far and we are ready indeed to give such a definition and that's the definition the set of our real numbers is the set of all cluster points for the rationals that's it all right so uh, let's move forward and now uh, we will uh, like to introduce the definition of uh, of the limit of a function let r let a i mean be a subset of the reals and let c be a cluster point of a for uh, for a function for a function f which is mapping a into r a real number l a real number l is said to be a limit of f at c if given epsilon which is positive there exists a delta which is positive such that if lil x is in a and 0 is less than x minus c which is less than delta then the distance between f of x and L can be made less than than epsilon. So, uh, <clears throat> so the intuition here is uh, is really the following. The intuition is that the limit of uh, of the function f limit of the function f uh, at the point c is uh, is the value l of which f of x is approaching
when x is approaching c. Uh, an illustration is, is probably uh, in order here. So this, these definitions can be regarded as, as, as follows. Suppose this is the x axis, this is some y axis, and I have uh, some function y is equal to f of x. And I would like to capture here the concept of uh, limit of f of x, and I have l over there, and I would like to capture the following concept. I would like to say that the limit of f of x when x is approaching c is equal to um, is equal to l. So I start with l which is some number on, uh, on, on the y-axis and then I fix epsilon which is a positive number and now I'm going to look at an epsilon neighborhood around L. So this will be L minus epsilon, and this here will be L plus epsilon. And uh, let's see, maybe this is what is being mapped to L minus epsilon, and this is what is being mapped to L plus epsilon. And, uh, and the point is, I can find, so here now, I can, there exists some delta, which uh, is positive and depends on epsilon, such that I can find a, a delta neighborhood around C, okay, so we can now find a delta neighborhood around C. So this will be C minus delta, and then this will be C plus delta, and this is my V delta C, and of course uh, this here is uh, V epsilon L. And so if you give me any epsilon, then I can find uh, uh, a, a delta neighborhood around C such that this delta depends on epsilon and also very often on C such that um, if I pick now any element X inside this neighborhood and then I compute F of X F of X will be trapped inside this bubble here F of X will be in uh, in the epsilon neighborhood around L for any x for any x in a delta neighborhood around uh, around C and, and clearly as epsilon is getting smaller and smaller by definition by by the definition of the limits you can always play, play this game so you can then say that uh, as x is approaching C f of x is approaching l and uh, we say and, and so 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 we say the following to repeat what the, the, the previous definition will say that for every epsilon which is greater than zero there exists delta which is positive and depends on uh, epsilon such that if uh, uh, the distance between x and c is less than delta, so x is the, this guarantees that x is never c, and this upper bound guarantees that the distance between x and c is less than delta. Then um, f of x minus l will be less than than epsilon, and that's the 
that's the definition of uh, of a limit all right so uh, it is worth now noting the following if we let f be a map taking a into r so be a function and uh, c is um, a cluster point of a not necessarily in a then uh, we will say that the limit of the function we we'll say that the limit of the function um, f at the point c exists and is equal to l if uh, for any epsilon neighborhood v epsilon l of l that exists uh, a delta neighborhood v delta c of c such that for any x in uh, v delta c a x not c uh, f of x is an element of v delta l and we write and then we write uh, that the limit of f of x when x is approaching c is is l okay so <clears throat> This leads us to uh, the next theorem, which uh, is stated as follows. If um, F is mapping A into R and C is a cluster point of A, then F can have only one limit uh, at C. And uh, here's a proof. Suppose There exists L and L prime in R such that the limit of f of x as x is approaching c is equal to L and somehow the limit of f of x as x is approaching c is equal to L prime. Now let's epsilon be a positive number then there is some delta which is positive such that 0 is less than this which is less than in delta right S uh, such that uh, if such that if then 
the distance between f of x and l can be made less than epsilon over 2, right? We can make the distance between f of x and l as small as desired, precise, uh, uh, provided that the distance between x and c is, uh, is less than delta. All right. So um, now, also, because we know this, then uh, uh, there, is, there is also there is some delta. Let me call this here delta prime, delta prime. Some delta second, uh, which is positive, such that if uh, zero is less than x minus c, which is less than delta second, uh, then uh, the distance between and the distance between f of x and l prime can be made less than um, epsilon over 2 as well. Okay. All right. Now, next, we note that l minus l prime is uh, the absolute value of l minus l prime minus f of x plus f of x and uh, this will be equal to let's say l minus f of x plus f of x uh, minus l prime and uh, by the triangle inequality then this is going to be less than l minus f of x plus L prime minus f of x and of course we can rewrite this as of f of x minus L plus uh, f of x minus L prime now uh, <coughs> now we would like to we so 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 in order to make L minus L prime less than epsilon then it is enough to uh, to make sure that uh, these two conditions here are, are met, right? And so, so that means that the distance between x and c is less than delta prime, and it's also le less than delta second. Okay, so to to force this to happen, we will let delta be the minimum of delta prime and delta second. Whichever is the smaller, we will pick it. So then if, uh, so assume, so assume now, assume that uh, zero is now less than x minus delta, x minus c, which is less than delta, then, uh, then we've seen that L minus L prime, right, which is less than uh, f of x minus L, plus f of x minus l prime will then be less than epsilon over 2 plus epsilon over 2 which sums up to epsilon thus we have proved that l minus l prime is less than epsilon for every positive epsilon and the only way this is possible is a uh, when the distance between L and L prime is equal to zero, thus L minus L prime must be equal to zero, and it follows that L must be L prime. Okay. Right. And this shows the uniqueness of a, of a, of a limit. All right. So feel free to pause the video, rewind, you know, and make sure that uh, you follow. You follow this argument. Next, I will uh, I would like to start with uh, I would like to continue with uh, some some straightforward example using now our definition of uh, of limit. We like to prove that the limit of the constant function two when x is approaching one is equal to two. Right. So so here maybe uh, a, a good picture helps. 
right, so this is this is the x-axis this is the y-axis this is the constant function y is equal to 2 and this is 1 right so you we start here and then you pick you pick some open sets some epsilon neighborhood this is 2 minus epsilon 2 plus epsilon around around 2 right let's see here and then notice that no matter what neighborhood I pick around 1 if I am inside this neighborhood and I compute f of x I get exactly 2 right and uh, the distance between 2 and 2 is 0 right so okay so so we want we want to prove the following we want to prove that for any epsilon which is positive there exists some delta which is positive depending on epsilon such that uh, if the distance between x and 1 is less than delta then the distance between 2 and 2 which is 0 here is less than epsilon and this is always true so right this this conclusion is always true so it makes sense that uh, you know any neighborhood will of of x will suffice so so to this end let epsilon be a positive number and i'll pick delta to be any positive number if i pick delta to be any positive uh, real number then assume that this condition holds right i'll pick uh, <coughs> uh delta here this is supposed to be delta here then uh since f of x is a constant and f of x is going to be um let me uh let me let's okay i'll say let x be a real number satisfying the condi the following condition zero is less than the distance between x minus one which is less than then delta the delta is arbitrarily taken uh, here then uh, by definition of my I will let my f of x here to be equal to 2 then uh, uh, the distance between f of x and uh, 2 is uh, 2 minus 2 which is 0 and that's less than epsilon thus we then conclude that the limit of 2 when uh, x is approaching 1 is going to be equal to 2 so so uh, so and this this ends the proof and we I remark here that um, there's nothing special about 1 uh, in fact uh, this example can be generalized can be generalized as follows let b be a constant and uh, see any real number then uh, the limit when x is approaching c of b is always
I would like you to pause the video and, and to try to prove this using using my proof as a, as a template. Try to establish these facts for uh, for yourself. Okay. Now let's move on to another example. This example is stated as follows: the limit. Uh, uh, when x is approaching c of x is equal to c, right? So, uh, <clears throat> so for the scrap work, let me establish what we want here. So we want to show that. For every epsilon greater than zero, there exists delta which is positive and depends on uh, epsilon such that if, um, if this condition holds, if the distance between x and c is in between 0 and, um, and delta, uh, then the distance between f of x and, and, uh, and c, for me here f of x is, uh, I'm setting f of x to be equal to x, of course. All right, so will be will be less than epsilon. right so okay so this is what we want to uh we, this is what we want to prove so so now notice that uh the statement so notice that this statement here zero is less than uh, f of x minus c which is less than epsilon this this is a statement which is actually equivalent to the statement zero which is less than x minus c which is less than than epsilon right and so so our conclusion our conclusion here uh so our conclusion is equivalent to our hypothesis And this is our hypothesis here. Right? So we saw that our conclusion is actually equivalent to our hypothesis. Therefore, this implication is clearly true. Right? And in fact, to, uh, to, to, uh, uh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. So our conclusion is equivalent to our hypothesis if we set delta to be equal to to epsilon. This is really important. I almost forgot to say that. Okay. So our conclusion is equivalent to our hypothesis if we decide to choose delta, right? Remember what you want to find is a delta which depends on epsilon. So if you choose your delta to be equal to epsilon, then your conclusion is equivalent, is logically equivalent to your hypothesis. Therefore, the implication must be true. So so then, then to, to make this statement true, if I would like to make this statement true, this statement here true, call this your star. So to make star true, it is enough to let um delta be equal to epsilon all right so so having said that then we can write our formal proof so so here we go so claim the limit as x is approaching c of x is equal to c and proof let epsilon be a positive number 
um next let's delta b equal to epsilon assume that zero the distance between x and delta is less than i'm sorry the distance between x and c is in between zero and delta then uh, Uh, for f of x is equal to x, we have that uh, the distance between f of x and c is precisely x, the distance between x and c, and that is a uh, less than delta by assumption which is equal to epsilon okay therefore we have proved that for every epsilon which is greater than zero if this condition holds then the distance between f of x and c is less than epsilon therefore the limit of f of x when x or the limit of x yeah when x is approaching c is going to be equal to c and this, this is how we prove that all right so let's move on to the next example let f of x be equal to x squared then uh, I would like to prove then I claim that the limit as x is approaching c of f of x has to be equal to c squared and uh, so so let's let's look at maybe uh, for our scrap work maybe let's illustrate what is happening here uh, this the graph of y is equal to x squared looks like something like this and if this is c this is c square if you pick some epsilon neighborhood around c So if this is uh, c squared minus epsilon, and uh, this is uh, c squared plus epsilon, then I should be able to find the point is if I take this band and go inside this band. Um, I should be able to find some some neighborhood right around uh, around C of radius Delta right? so I should be able to find some some V Delta C here such that such that if I pick any X here if my X is located here and I compute f of x, then um, f of x should be inside this this bubble, right? And 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 the points the points here is really important to say that delta uh, will be a function will be a function of of uh, of of epsilon and potentially c as well right it might depends where c is located right how you choose your delta and clearly the 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 radius of this interval here depends on how wide or how narrow epsilon is right so and and and, and the, the point of this proof is to make all of this as transparent and uh, as possible and, and to quantify all of these things very very precisely 
So let me start by stating in our scrap work what it is that we want to show. So we want to show, we want to prove, we want to show that for every epsilon which is greater than zero, there exists some delta which is positive, of course, depending on epsilon, I won't say that, I won't write that this time, such that if uh, the distance between x and c is less than delta, then uh, and it's bigger than zero, then the distance between f of x and c square will be less than epsilon. All right. So I, I need to really understand this this uh, this quantity here, maybe. And because that's my conclusion, right? So this is my conclusion. Essentially, and this is sort of my hypothesis. So to write to write a direct proof, it's it's it is essential to understand the the conclusion. So so note that um, if you write f of x minus c square. Right, that's really just x squared minus c squared, absolute value of that. And we can maybe factor this. And why would we do that? Why would we factor this? It's because I want to make a statement about the difference between x squared and c squared. But, but I don't know how to do that. I know how to control the distance between x and c. I don't know yet how to control the distance between x squared and c squared. But the fact that I can factor in terms of x minus c maybe will, will be helpful. So we know that this is just x minus c time x plus c and uh, the absolute value of a product is a product of absolute value. All right. Okay. So then I can do that. And I also have, so, so then, I, and I know I can control this thing here. I don't know whether I can control this or not, but I do have the uh, the triangular inequality, right? So this would be x minus c times the absolute value of x plus the absolute value of c. And this is by the triangle inequality. All right, and then... Um, <coughs> and then maybe we can say, okay, I can make I can I can impose a restriction on on my neighborhood, right? Because I I, I can choose delta, right? So maybe let's say let's start by saying that this neighborhood is not too large for now. So maybe uh, on the side note here, let me put another note. Another note here is that if I decide to choose my the, the the radius of my neighborhood to be no more than one, then this is actually equivalent to negative one. Uh, okay, so we know. I'm sorry. So we know that the distance between the absolute value of x and the absolute value of c is uh, is less in the distance between the absolute value of x and c and that's less than one right so so um, uh, and and then and then this really me this really implies that the distance between the absolute value of x and the absolute value of c is less than 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 one and uh, and this mean really that negative one is less than the absolute value of x minus the absolute value of c, which is less than one, and that's equivalent to uh, so solving this, uh, adding the absolute value of c everywhere, then we get that the absolute value of c minus one is less than the absolute value of x, which is less than one plus the absolute value of c. All right, so. By by making sure that you know the this neighborhood here 
is no more than uh, uh, this this radius the radius of this neighborhood is no more than one then I can control the absolute value of X so so C is a constant it's controllable uh, now the absolute value of X is controllable if I impose this condition right so I can control this sum and I can control this so therefore I should be able to control this this product right so if we make this assumption here then what we have is that this thing then becomes less than the absolute value of x minus c time 1 plus the absolute value of c plus the absolute value of c because the absolute value of x is less than is less than this according to our calculation here and this is just the absolute value of x minus c time two, uh, 1 plus 2 times the absolute value of C. All right. Okay, so now we are now we, we, we know how to control this quantity here. And uh, <clears throat> so to make so we'll observe that to make The distance between x square and c square less than epsilon, it uh, it suffices to make to make sure that um, so let me rewrite what we have here. Uh, so uh, earlier, so we have again this is scrap work. Okay, so it doesn't have to be all clean. So we have x square minus c square. We prove that this is uh, less or equal to x minus c time 1 plus 2 times absolute value of c, right? So if I want to make this thing here less than epsilon, it's enough to uh, to make sure that a um, okay the, the distance between x and c is less than epsilon over 1 plus 2 times absolute value of C, right? Because if this is less than, if this thing here is less than epsilon over 1 plus 2 times the absolute value of C, then, I'm sorry, if if this here is less than epsilon over 1 plus 2 times the absolute value of C, uh, then um, this product will be less than, uh, will be less than epsilon, right? So, so we need two conditions. The first condition is uh, what we've observed, that the distance between x and c will be less than 1. And then the second condition is that the distance between x and c is less than epsilon over uh, over uh, uh, 1 plus 2 times the absolute value of c. So so, so our delta, so finally, to make the, all of this work, it uh, suffices to uh, let delta be the minimum of 1 and epsilon over 2 times absolute value of c plus 1. If we choose our delta like uh, uh, <coughs> satisfying these conditions, so a and b will be satisfied and we'll be able to repeat all the calculations that we've done previously to, uh, to, uh, to, to, to get the desired result. So let's make this happen. Okay, so let's write our formal proof. All right, formal proof. Given epsilon, which is greater than zero, let delta be the minimum of one and epsilon over two times absolute value of C plus one. Now, assume that x is a real number such that uh, 0 is less than the absolute value of x minus c, which is less than delta, then this quantity here is the product x minus c time x plus c 
and by the triangle inequality we have that x square minus c square is uh, less or equal to x minus c time absolute value of x plus absolute value of c now since the distance between x and c is less than 1 and since the distance between x, the absolute value of x and the absolute value of c is less or equal to the distance between x and c, which is less than 1, we have that negative 1 is less than this quantity here. Uh, thus, adding, adding up the absolute value of c gives As such, um, we then get that x squared minus c squared, the distance between x squared minus c squared, is less or equal to this product, and the absolute value of x is less than absolute value of c plus 1 plus absolute value of c, which is x minus c time 1 plus 2 time absolute value of C and uh, since um, the distance between X and C is uh, less than epsilon over 1 plus 2 time absolute value of C as well according to this this assumption here right then let me call this here star. Oh well, I'll just okay. Then the distance between x square and c square, which is uh, less or equal to x minus c time one plus two time absolute value of c, is going to be less than x minus c time one plus two time absolute value of c. Here this is. This is the punchline, right? This is less than epsilon over 1 plus 2 times absolute value of C. And these two cancel each other out. So we get so we get uh, so we get epsilon. Very good. Therefore we conclude that the limit of um, x square minus c square as x is approaching c I'm sorry of x square is equal to c square all right okay so that's good let's move on to another to, to another example and for this example, we would like to show that the limit of 1 over x as x is approaching c is equal to 1 over c if uh, c is uh, greater than 0. So discussion or scrap work. We know we want to prove, so we state exactly what we want to prove. We want to prove that for every epsilon greater than zero, there exists delta which is positive. Delta is depending on epsilon always, such that uh, if this condition holds, then 
uh, is less than epsilon. So, um, all right. So let's again let's look at our this quantity here, right? So we would like to make a statement about about this, but it's not clear whether we can use our hypothesis to to make this estimation right so let's look at this thing here well common denominator tells us that we get what c minus x over cx uh, the absolute value of a ratio is a ratio of absolute value so And I guess right away we are happy to see the absolute value of x minus c on the numerator. Right, so it's good to have that. But um, so so this is a good news because we know we can make we can control. We have complete control over this. But but the denominator seems a little bit problematic because we don't know whether we can uh, we can control the denominator yet. Right, especially because it's uh, we are dividing by something which may be getting very 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 small so this thing maybe is is growing very quickly we don't know okay well so maybe let me write it in a more useful way so we know that c and x are both uh, let's say positive so let's um, I will assume here that uh, 1 over x is defined let's just assume that 1 over x is defined so we'll assume that the domain of uh, 1 over x is 0 to infinity for us so that's you know everything is good so this product here is just c times x all right so so i can control this and i, I wonder whether i can control can we control this this quantity here right so so we need we need to find an upper bound we need to find an upper bound for 1 over cx where x satisfies specific criteria. To be determined. Okay, all right. So maybe I can impose some condition on the neighborhood of x on delta, which allows me to uh, to 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 make to control this quantity here. Okay. So so this is what I'm going to be working on now. So uh, so note note uh, first note that. The distance between x and c is less than delta is equivalent to negative delta is less than x minus c, which is less than delta, right? And this is equivalent to c minus delta, which is less than x, which is less than delta plus c. And uh, and if we if we let so if we letting delta be let's say c over 2 gives that c minus c over 2 is less than x which is less than c over 2 plus c and this thing here is equivalent to c over 2 is less than x which is less than 3c over 2 and uh, I want to stress here that um, this inequality here is important why? Because it's telling me that I can bound x from below by c over 2, which means that I can bound 1 over x from above by its reciprocal. And that's something that I really want, right? Because we wanted to control 1 over x times c. Okay, so, so, okay. so, so the point, point here is that c over 2 is less than x 
implies that 2 over c is greater than 1 over x and then uh, uh, multiplying this by uh, so if I multiply this by 1 over c left and right which is what I want to control then um, we get 2 over c squared is greater than 1 over xc or in other words or 1 over xc is less than 2 over c squared so if I uh, if I let delta be uh, equal to c over 2 then then I'm able to to make this to control thing here things here uh, all right so <coughs> So 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 let me let me resume a, a little bit. Let me go back uh, uh, to our previous observation. So we have the following. So if um, the distance between x and c is in between zero and c over two, then one over c x time x minus c. This distance here will be less than two over c square time x minus time the absolute value of x minus c and next uh, to make 2 over c squared time x minus c less than epsilon which is which will give me the desired result uh, it uh, suffices it suffices to make suffices to make sure that a the distance between x and c is uh, is less right if I want to make this thing here less than epsilon over if I want this to be less than epsilon I just need to make sure that the distance between x and c is uh, is less than um, epsilon over c square over 2 right okay first maybe this is puzzling so let me let me uh, substantiate this right so on a side note if i want this inequality right and if i solve this inequality for the absolute value of x minus c i get that the absolute value of x minus c is less than epsilon times c square over 2 right so so that's that's exactly what what i'm what I'm stating here right this is what this is all about and then secondly we want of course for for this calculation to happen this calculation which we saw was important to happen we needed the following restrictions so there are two restrictions which are needed and as long as both of those restrictions are met, then we are home. All right. So, <clears throat> so this is our discussion. All right. So now we can then put everything together to write our formal proof. So our proof goes like this. Given epsilon, which is a positive number, I will let delta be the minimum to ensure both conditions to happen of c over 2 and c square epsilon over 2. Okay, now assume that x is a positive number and uh, the distance between x and c is less than delta then we see that the distance between 1 over x and 1 over c is less than x minus c over x times c which is 1 over xc times x minus c now since the distance between x and c is less than c over 2 um, then we have that 
negative c over 2 is less than x minus c which is less than x uh, then which is less than c over 2 and as a result solving for x gives us that c over 2 is less than x which is less than 3c over 2 thus this implies that um, 2 over c is greater than 1 over x and 2 over c square is greater than 1 over xc so 1 over xc time the distance between x and c is then less than 2 over c square time the absolute value of x minus c okay now next since the distance between x and c is um, less than c square epsilon over 2 we obtain that 1 over x minus 1 over c is less than 2 over c square times x minus c which will then be less than 2 over c square times c square epsilon over 2 and, and clearly um, this will cancel each other out so we are just left with um, epsilon here therefore we have proved that the limit of uh, 1 over x as x is approaching c is equal to 1 over c.